got a license to talk. Shocking. Positively shocking. And the words are for your ears only. I think you got the point. Welcome to The Words Are Not Enough. On episode number eight of The Words Are Not Enough, will Bond 25 give us the steamy romance between Bond and Monty Penny that no one is asking for? An original manuscript of Ian Fleming's The Man with the Golden Gun emerges. And we give you our top 10 worst Bond songs. Stay tuned. Yeah, baby. (laughs) What is up, everyone? And welcome back to another episode of The Words Are Not Enough, our weekly James Bond podcast. I am Griffin, 008 Schiller. And I am Brody, 005 Cervelli. I don't remember my call number for there for a second. It just, uh, hey, yeah. there we go. And I didn't go on to introduce you this time because you're a big boy now. Oh, you wow. can introduce yourself. Yay, I made it. I did it, oh, Mom. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just working out perfectly. There we go. Oh, beautiful. Um, yeah, so we got kind of a light show here for you guys today. A little, um, bit, little bit. We've got some news. We've got some great stuff in Q Branch. Let me just tell you that. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. And yes. then we've got a very <laughs> lively discussion that we're going to have regarding <laughs> our top ten worst Bond songs. It's going to be. Can we just skip to the end? I want to just talk about this right now. I'm like, I'm all fired up. I'm all ready to I defend. I am, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. Like I am in the same boat as you. I am very excited to talk about that because we're gonna have a we're gonna have some uh, butting heads during. Yeah, a, so if, a if, few if, parts if you've listened to previous episodes, we kind of end up on the same page on a lot of things. Um, this one is going to tear down the house, so to speak. Oh it's, yeah, uh, we may never be able to talk to each other again <laughs> after this one. I am I'm almost sure of it. I really am. Oh yeah, I'm almost sure. That's of it. it. But uh, before we dive into too much stuff here, Brody. Yes. How has your week been? How have uh, you been? How? Have, oh wow, wow! This is this is supposed. This is going to be a, just a regular thing. We're going to start oh. off the show. I'm just going to ask you how your day has been, how your week has been. Uh, my week's been good. It's been getting a little cold here in uh, scenic Indiana, um, so it's uh, yeah, it's a little chilly, but I'm surviving, and that's good. Um, I did. We were going to talk about this in the show, but we decided to cut it for time. But I, I did yeah. see the foreigner. And finally, the more, the more I think about it, the more I hate it. So, uh, <laughs> Martin Campbell, what have you done to Brody? Martin Campbell, and it's, not, it's not Martin Campbell's fault. Martin Campbell did. Martin Campbell is what um one of my I, I did a screenwriting class uh, my freshman year, and the best bit of screenwriting advice I ever got was from this professor, and they said that um you don't write the movie, you write the script. And Martin mm-hmm. Campbell is the kind of director that doesn't direct the movie; he directs the script. So yep. he's yeah. kind of completely dependent on his script. And and I think he had a weak script for this one. Interesting elements, good performances, yeah. and, and cool action scenes, but some parts are just lacking a little bit. So that, that's, that's my week. What about you, Griffin? Oh, uh, you know, just same old, same old. Just working <laughs> on you know YouTube's and, and stuff, and How exciting. Uh, you know, prepping for this lovely show because I love to prep for it. But going back to Foreigner real quick, I oh, do. Yeah. You know. Because we might as well just talk about it right now. Well, um, I, I do think that that is one of the best performances we've seen from Pierce Brosnan ever. Oh, yeah. Easily. Ever. Yeah. He was so you good in that movie. You didn't movie. like him in Mamma Mia? You know, that's a close <laughs> second. Mm. Honestly, it's tough, but I got to give the edge to the foreigner. What's, no, your, what's, kidding, what's, your, what's your number one Brosnan Bond performance then? Just curious. Oh, that's really tricky because... I like him in Goldeneye, but I do think that he was still getting accustomed to the character. He was definitely yeah. more confident in Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough. The movies obviously were not as good as Goldeneye, but yeah. I thought Pierce Brosnan kind of hit his stride when he went through uh, Tomorrow Never Dies and then uh, yeah. The World Is Not Enough. Because I think his performance in both of those movies are actually fairly similar. Like, There's not too much differing, um, differentiating them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think but, he has more 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 meat to chew in the world is not enough. He has more like there's more I like agree. with, with Electro, yeah. there's a lot more like sort of uh dramatic stuff in it. Um yeah. I love the way he delivered the line, um like uh what was it? Um Electra's little mo- like motto. It was um Ah shit, what was oh, the thing she says? Yeah, she says I, a thing and um, then um 
Ah, oh, shit, I forget. But um, you know, I haven't bad. seen the movie in a while. Yeah, and it's, it's been a little bit. But um, the way he yeah. says the line, it's just, <laughs> just dripping with venom, and it's it's really really good. Um, oh yeah, it's it's like like um, life's not worth living if you can't feel alive, and like the way he says, oh it, yeah, um, something like that. Yeah, he repeats yeah. it to her like when he sort of figures out that she may be bent. And mm-hmm. it is a really, really good moment. Um, I actually think his performance in Die Another Day isn't that bad either. The movie's not great, but no, he he's he's fine. Is very, it. very he's just, comfortable you know, in that movie. Yeah. Like he he is Bond in that movie, which is nice. He's kind of like aware of his age in that movie. I think. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah, he definitely, definitely just a little, a little bit. <laughs> oh my god, no, but yeah, yeah Pierce. The, the, those were interesting. Uh, you know. The way he kind of like matured in the role, it was like unfortunate as he got more mature in the films. The like the movie just like progressively got worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! But um, <laughs> but enough about Pierce and, and Martin Campbell and all that stuff. Let's dive into the news. We had a yes. nice little tangent there. That was, that was uh, good. all right. Starting with, of course, we got a reference. Elliot Carver, uh, "Tomorrow <laughs> Never Lies," just. So delicious. Delicious. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, man. I will never understand for the life of me why we always go back to the bras of films. <laughs> it, 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 just, it must be a product of our upbringing. It's just... Uh, it really we, has We gravitate to it. Yeah. To it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Going into this. So, Bond 25, of course, we've got some rumors that are circulating the interwebs once again. Woo-hoo. So, in an apparent exclusive from Archive 007, which I believe is a Spanish double or Spanish like James Bond blog or something yes, like that. Yes. That's what um, I think, yeah. Right. Apparently, they've been pretty on top of some of this stuff, and they even stated that they got a scoop that Craig was going to return for Bond 25 before he actually even yeah. announced it. I so could have told I you guess, that, though, so who knows? Well, <laughs> hey, come on. They reported it, and they're taking credit for some stuff there. But hey, anyways, yeah. so in an apparent exclusive from Archive 007, Daniel Craig's stunt double, Ben Cook, has reportedly stepped into the role of stunt coordinator for Bond 25, replacing longtime coordinator Gary Powell. Oh. So... Very minor bit of news here, but still pretty interesting. Yeah. Which, you know, the question remains here, even though Ben Cook is going to be the 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 stunt coordinator, do you think it's still possible that he could be the stunt double as well and just kind of be doing all of the, the, the stunt stuff, I guess, if you could say? Or do you think he'll be too busy being the stunt coordinator. I don't know. There's a few different ways I can look at this, but yeah. um, it is interesting. I think he'll be too busy. Like he's got to, he's got to do so much. Uh, and I also think he, it'd be too much of a liability to have their right. most important like stunt person on the set putting his life in. Like if it's, if they're safe. Hopefully they're safe. There's been a little, couple of stories lately about like maybe stunt work isn't as safe as we thought, but um, it's relatively safe. I would say. If, Mm-hmm. But still, it is a risk. You don't want him to like fracture his arm or something minor, um, yeah, yeah, and then have sure. to carry on for the rest of the. F- it's an action film, so he's going to be involved with every step of the process. So, oh yeah, absolutely. I don't, yeah, I think they may just find someone else to do Daniel Craig stunts, which is not a uh, bad thing. It's sad to see Gary Powell go. Gary Powell's done that's uh, what, really, that really was my next job. thing. Yeah. I was going to say that's like he's been on. Oh, what was the first one he did? What like Casino Royale or something uh, like that? I want to say Casino Royale. Yeah, I think I think he was brand new on that one because yeah. I remember Steven Spielberg saw him on that and then signed him up for uh, Indian Jones because he was so yeah, impressed. Right. Um, no, and, and I mean, you know, if you just look at the stunts and, um, oh no, I'm sorry, he was in Tomorrow Never Dies too. I just pulled up the list here. He wasn't. Oh yeah, he was in Tomorrow Never Dies. He was in Golden Eye. Oh, um, I think Golden Eye may have been his first one. I'm looking. So he at was his there with the IMDb changing of the god here. with like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Which, like, you know, it's a long time. Pe- oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was saying a lot of the long time like sort of Bond people replaced in Golden Eye, like so, like um. We lost Murray Spinder, um, and so he was out for doing the uh, opening credits. Um, mm-hmm. uh, production designer became um, uh, shit. What's his name? Um, oh, that's in my tongue. But the production designer changed, um, and a lot of different Peter Lamont. That's it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess Gary Powers was one of those like sort of he wasn't part of the old guard. When it came to Bond, like, because a lot of the original people were sort of involved in Bond up until the end of uh, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton films, right. and then they sort of right. they, they sort of reborn 
Um, and a big part of that is when Cubby passed away after um, GoldenEye, so then they sort of just shifted everyone. So this is kind of this is kind of bittersweet because he's been around since then, and now yeah, I mean he was well, yeah. just looking back at the credits here. He was actually uh, a stunt double in the Brosnan films, and then he got a uh, promotion to stunt coordinator in Casino Royale, and gotcha. that was his first okay. Bond as you know uh, stunt coordinator. But um, oh, but yeah, yeah, he's been with young. the franchise for a long time, so it's definitely like quite a bit of a loss really if you look especially if you look at the stunts from the the court at least from a coordination standpoint the stunts from casino royale were incredible just look at that opening one the with the uh the chase in in madagascar and then the one in the Mm -hmm. airport in miami um even the coordination it took to do the the flipping of the aston martin i mean there are some incredible stunts in in the uh uh, uh, the Daniel Craig film. So to to you know take on that task of becoming the new stunt coordinator, that's yeah. definitely it'll be tough. But, um, and Even it's definitely the, um, a loss. Oh yeah. Those, oh no, but I, I'm just gonna say it, it was definitely a loss. But I think Ben Cook, you know, having been around the production, kind of following the same path that Gary Powell did. Yeah. Uh, I I think he's in a position where he can you know. Uh, whip up some good stunts for Craig to do in his last outing, and then he'll probably remain on for the next Bond as well as a coordinator. More than likely, yeah, and that's that's good. This is a <laughs> nice bit of job security for him because the next Bond may not look like Daniel Craig. So, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Quickly, yeah, that's that, for sure. Get out of that position while you still can, so you, mm-hmm. you're, you're still essential to the production. That's a <laughs> smart man. But um, yeah, no, this will be. Uh, I, I, yeah, I was just, I was just gonna say, even um. Even like the opening scene for like Spectre with the helicopter stunt and all that, like, like there's, yes. there's a lot of really really yes. cool stunts even now. Like so, because uh, I know you were focusing on Casino Royale a lot, which has a lot of like really tangible stunts. But um, right, right, that's those are just like the first ones that come to mind. Honestly, yeah, I mean, you, could, yeah. you could go to the car, the car chase at the beginning of uh, Quantum. Oh yeah, probably absolutely. one of the best parts of that movie. To be honest with you, I'm pretty sure. Um, was Ben Cook the driver for? Because he was Daniel Craig's stunt Was he the driver for that scene? Because I know I remember back when that was coming out. A yeah. bunch of tabloids were running stories about how um, Daniel Craig can't drive stick, so his stunt driver <laughs> has to do it for him. I remember that. And oh, my God. Like, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, it was an absolute shit show because apparently you need to be able to drive stick to be James Bond. Um, and Daniel Craig can't drive stick. So is he yeah. really James Bond right? or is yeah. Ben Cook really James Bond? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, I just remember that. So I wonder if that was uh, Ben Cook or not. I probably should have mm. looked that up. It may up. have oh, been. Wow. It may have been. <laughs> Who knows? But, um, but yeah, it'll be – just to put a cap on this, it'll be sad to see Gary Powell go. And we definitely thank him for his work on the franchise. I oh, think yeah. he's been a great asset. Time for the newcomer, Ben Cook, to step into the coordinator position and uh, see what he can do. So hopefully Bond 25 has some badass stunts which I'm, I'm pretty sure it will. All right, moving on to the next topic here, and it's some rumor, or not Ooh. rumors, but I guess it's, you know, an interesting little tidbit that has popped up here. So it seems the writing process for Bond 25 is in full swing, like we predicted several episodes ago. We were That's like, right, the end yeah. of the year. They're definitely going to be getting the, the wheels turning on the script. Um, and according to The Express, we've been getting a lot of stuff from them uh, lately. So yeah. this may actually be true. Um, an anonymous LA source has claimed the following regarding the ongoing scripting process. And the, the quote is this. The production company have reached out to several writers su- to suggest plot ideas and twists for Bond in Daniel Craig's final outing. Mm-hmm. They wanted ideas that had not been seen in their franchise before to try to shake things up. One idea was for Bond finally to move beyond flirting and one-liners and actually share a, roman- a romance with <laughs> Monty Penny. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that idea was nixed as it would go against the whole relationship built up during their screen careers. <laughs> yes. So um, this seems in line with comments that uh, Naomi Harris has recently made regarding her off-screen relationship with Daniel Craig and how their chemistry plays on screen. And she said the following. Chemistry is something you either have or don't have, so it's a real gamble when people cast you, because you just never know whether the chemistry is going to work. Sometimes you have couples who are dating in real life and they have no chemistry on screen whatsoever, so you just never know. I am just lucky that it works with Daniel, and I'm looking forward to coming back. So she is, in fact, coming back. We're not replacing yes. Monty Penny anytime soon. Excellent. Uh, while she doesn't outright state it, her comments seem to suggest a, co- a continuation on of the uh, platonic but flirtatious dynamic we have seen thus far in the series. So, Brody, let me just get your quick thoughts on this. Uh, first of all, uh, what do you think of the notion of Bond 
actually being with Monty Penny, going past flirting. I already know what you think of it because I think the same thing. Um, and then what do you make of uh, Naomi Harris's comments here? Um, that, yeah, bad idea. Like, it just takes the, the, yeah, it takes, like, the fun kind of dynamic that they have. Like, Money Penny and Bond is kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, mm -hmm. it was a little less so, like, like it, Money Penny went through, like, a, a, a cycle. So, like, Money Penny was, it was fun and flirtatious in the Connery films. And then it was kind of... Eh, in the Roger Moore films, and then it got right. desperately sad in the Timothy Dalton films, and then it bounced back up in the Brosnan films and became fun again. Um, mm -hmm. Mainly because Money Penny's whole shtick is that she likes Bond, she thinks she's attracted to Bond, but she is a strong woman herself, mm -hmm. and she kind of gives it back to him because he flirts with her and she gives it right back. Um, right, right. And, I mean, he'd love to sleep with her, but she's never going to do that because she doesn't yeah, just want to be another girl. You yeah, know? exactly. And so she, she's like, she's got a thing for him, but it's not like uh, lusting after him. Whereas like, right. when, when you go to the Timothy Dalton films, um, the, she was like fawning over him. And it's like, this is sad. Like, you were just so yeah, sad. Yeah. Um, and then it comes back with uh, with Samantha Bond as uh, Money Penny, where she's like kind of giving him shit again. And it's like, good. And I think uh, Naomi Harris has a great rapport with in a great in the, she it's the does. same thing it's like but they really have does. but they have like it's electric this this chemistry but um she's not sleeping with bond because she doesn't want to not because she can't have him because she doesn't want to and that's great like right. that's amazing cuz like uh, and it's great like, in, in, inspector we saw like she was sleeping with someone else and then bond gets a little jealous like it's like yeah yeah it's gets a little taste of his own medicine yeah, yeah. So that's fun and I, I i think it would ruin the relationship then it becomes like an awkward like coworkers who had sex kind of dynamic and it's like Ugh. right like right. that's just uncomfortable I, like. <laughs> no no i agree with you i think the closest they ever got was in skyfall when she's giving him that shave but mm. you knew that she was never going to sleep with him and I think Bond was all like oh I'm gonna sleep with you like mm -hmm. and she's like nope shuts the door and I love that because that's that is very clearly the closest they will ever get but they won't do they won't go past that because yeah. she knows better and you know she's not gonna let her guard down for a one night stand with a co-worker and I think that's actually what makes their their bond so strong <laughs> bond if you will <laughs> <laughs> their, their, their bond so strong because they haven't cro they haven't breached that personal um, yeah. area because I agree with you I think if they if that was to actually happen it would be a bit awkward um, and just be I, weird, I don't think yeah. the fans would like it because it's you know it's very playful and it's very funny the back and forth the flirtatious you know oh I wish you'd sleep with me even though, but they they both know that it's just not going to happen yet they go off on these like flirtatious tangents yeah. anyways and it's it's part of what makes the rapport fun like that is Monty Penny and Bond so I, I would never want to actually see them breach that you know personal area there yeah per and, and, his, and his, I just like, I forgot something completely um, blocked mm -hmm. it from my memory but um, they actually do kind of breach that once in um, the end of Dying of the Day and oh but that doesn't really count but it's a hologram no. and, but, but it's I, I think that would be it, it, that feels gross and like kind of mean. Like Money Penny is like weird. it's yeah. weird because Money Penny is like again like Money Penny her Money Penny uh, Smith Bond's Money Penny was so good. Like she was just so like casual with Bond and so flippant. And then suddenly in Dying of the Day, she's masturbating on the floor of Q's lab essentially <laughs> to a hologram of Bond making out with her, and it's like. Oh really? Like oh come on, that's kind of sad. Like go that home, is really find sad. a boyfriend, yeah. money penny. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that would, and that's how it would feel. It would feel like that. That's such a betrayal of the character. It would make money penny less of a independent person and more of just like a a schoolgirl. So yeah, exactly. So exactly. yeah, no, I it, think I think we're both on the same page on this topic. But um, it's still interesting that I guess they're considering the possibility. I just it's I think it's very evident that they're not going to go through with that. Yeah. So moving on to our last topic here with tomorrow never lies, uh, and it's actually not really a news topic, but it is interesting and it was news enough that we felt the need to put it in here. So we're just gonna dive right into this. So go for it. Excuse me. Oh, got a little. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> in a recent interview with Empire, David Fincher revealed that he would not want to do a Star Wars film due to the immense pressure, adding that he had discussed helming the upcoming Episode Nine with Kathleen Kennedy. 
excuse me, <laughs> like hiccuping, but ultimately declined. <laughs> very awkward. Um, while this doesn't directly pertain to Bond, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, David Fincher is actually a name that has come up frequently surrounding the James Bond franchise, but is an idea that has often been dismissed um, because, you know, Fincher doesn't seem to have the immediate excitement to jump onto a franchise, at least so we thought, um, mm-hmm. as be- because of his uh, past experiences with Alien 3, which is completely understandable. That movie right, is yeah. awful. Um, but with this news, it is interesting because, um, you know, the fact that he toyed around with and considered the idea of doing a Star Wars film, does this mean that he may, in fact, consider Bond at some point down the road? Um, you know, you look at it, he's doing World War Z 2, which, why are why are we wasting David Fincher's talents yeah. on World War Z 2? Oh, it's just, man. I will never understand it. But anyways, so he's clearly not as afraid of doing a franchise film as we thought. I mean, he's hopping in to do the sequel to World War Z, which was a mildly successful film. Hmm. So, Brody, thoughts? Yes. You know, do you mean, do you think that this means that he may, um, you know, uh, enter, entertain the idea of, of doing a Bond film? I mean, clearly he probably hasn't been approached yet. Or m- maybe he has been approached, but... You know the the discussions probably haven't you know developed into anything. So, what what is your take on all this? Um, I think I actually I I think this is somewhat promising. Um, just because I was like like you mentioned, I was of the impression that David Fincher was just wouldn't touch a franchise with a fifty foot pole. Um, right, I think most people would agree with you. Yeah, yeah and so and yeah, what was he is a franchise, but it's not really a franchise. You know what I mean? Like it's it's very very. It wants to be a franchise, I guess. It's very, I guess very, it's kind um, of like when he did The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It's like that wasn't a franchise, but yeah, if they had actually yeah. gone through with it, he would have made three films. He would have had sequels and films. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so um, I think I was just – I never really consider it as a franchise. Um, but then, okay. yeah, hearing that he – like, of course he was approached. I think everyone in Hollywood was approached for Star Wars. Um, mm-hmm. But – well, everyone talented in Hollywood anyway. But um, the fact that he considered it – and ultimately just decided not to do it because of the pressure. And that's what he's telling us anyway. But I don't think he has any reason to lie about this. Um, he could easily just say, I don't want to do it. Um, but, yeah, the fact that he, did, he turned it down because of the of the pressure, but actually considered doing one of the biggest franchises in the world. Yeah, why not do a Bond film? There's a little less pressure because right. uh, Bond is huge, I- but it's not like – it's not – a conglomerate like Star Wars is right. It's not, well, and the, and the yeah. thing is that you know, Bond. I mean, Bond fans are very opinionated. They're very strong, but they're, they're also a little bit more forgiving than Star Wars fans Star because Wars fans we've had just, bad films yeah. in the past. We, you yeah. know, we, we've had enough. You know, through our, throughout the twenty four sp- film span of of James Bond, we have had some serious duds. So we are no stranger to bad Bond films. However, I mean, I think if you're going to bring David Fincher on to do a Bond film, you're not going to get get a bad movie whatsoever. The man is incredible. Oh yeah, um, and I think uh, he's he's totally he's very very suited to bond uh at least this, oh, this iteration yeah. of bond so um i think it would just it, it seems like if the bond producers aren't thinking about it uh i i mean i just highly doubt that they're not thinking they haven't considered it um because mm-hmm. he is so in tune with that kind of aesthetic um mm-hmm. i think this this is good this is there's a good chance he may eventually one day maybe not now probably not now um Somewhere but down the road, for sure. Down yeah. the road, yeah. Why not? Like, I think this is this is the nice, the first indication that we've ever had. And the reason I kind of wanted to talk about it just because, it, it, as, as someone who's always wanted him to do a Bond film, but just thought it was a pie in the sky kind of thing, this mm-hmm. is really really cool. Like, this is this is awesome. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, and maybe reaching like you know, uh, reaching a little bit just to get to this like sort of conclusion. But eh, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> like, you never know. Weirder things have happened. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, I think you, you know, you, you look at some of his previous works. Um, what he does really well is mystery and suspense. So I think if he were to tackle yeah. one, we would, we could potentially get like another. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be Cold War era, but like a similar kind of feeling film, kind of like a From Russia with Love, yeah, maybe Russia a little bit love, of yeah. the Living Daylights thrown in there, that sort of thing, um, which would be really refreshing because everything we've had with the Craig era has been very 
bad guy, action heavy, it's more character, you know, emotional oriented. It hasn't really been so much spy spy typeness. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, they, they, you're right. I think they are they are they're character pieces rather than um plot driven stories. A lot right. I mean, they they have good plots um most of them, but it's secondary to the character's journey. Whereas I think yeah, yeah David Fincher would do a really good uh, Bond story that is like from Rush with Love, Little Living Daylights is very story driven, very like yeah. intrigue based, which is great. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Like, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to see him do if if he was going to do one, I'd like to see him do the one after Christopher Nolan personally. Yeah, no, I'd love that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, Ooh, that'd be great. What a, what but anyways, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Potentially, We're looking potentially the, um, Denis Villeneuve, then Christopher Nolan, then David Fincher. Jesus Christ, my britches. Jesus, this is uh, just like the Oscar <laughs> caliber Bond films coming up. But <laughs> anyways, let us know all your thoughts and opinions on uh, whether you think David Fincher has a good possibility of directing a Bond film in the future and any of the topics that we've discussed in Tomorrow Never Lies in the comments section of wherever you're watching. Um, and that is going to do it for Tomorrow Never Lies. Told you we got a short segment here. Oh, yeah. So moving on to Q Q Branch. Now, Q Branch, we've got some really meaty stuff here that I'm actually going to let Brody, I'm going to let you take the lead on this um, because you are our Fleming aficionado. You're more in tune with the novels than myself. So, and and our our main story here has to do with Fleming and a um, a manuscript that has actually emerged uh, for um, um, the man with the golden gun. So, Yes. Brody, take it away. The floor so, is yours. Uh, I guess a little backstory. Uh, the Man with the Golden Gun is the last novel that uh, Ian Fleming penned. Um, and there's been a lot of speculation surrounding uh, this story. And the, the reason this is so interesting to me is because um, cause Ian Fleming died so soon after he supposedly finished The Man with the Golden Gun. A lot mm-hmm. of There's been a lot of speculation that he didn't quite... like He, he finished a draft of it but didn't fully get to finish with his revisions right um because he was notoriously very uh he had a very strict schedule where he would go to um goldeneye his his uh residence in uh jamaica he would go early of uh beginning of the year just bust out a story and then bring it back to london have it be revised uh, communicate with the publishers and then go back and like fine tune it and then release and like he he did that with pretty much all of his books and with the man with the golden gun essentially what he did was the same thing but he kind of died relatively close to the end of that process so it's not 100 percent sure whether or not he fully finished the story or if um uh kingsley amis who later went on to write uh colonel sun which is a fantastic James Bond novel, uh, 1966, I believe, um, was sort of like directly after the Fleming books. There's a lot of rumors that he finished the book because he wrote, he he did write revisions for uh, Ian Fleming and sent it to him because they, they were friends. And this sort of corroborates a bit of that because we we just got um, released is a 182 um, page corrected typescript. Um, of revisions, essentially. Um, they're, they're handwritten. There's probably they're approximately 80 pages uh, with editorial revisions in green and black ink, if that's uh, details that fascinates you. Um, and they're, they're, apparently there were quite significant uh, changes made to this this manuscript, including uh, like, like sentence structure, paragraphs, that sort of thing. So that's, I guess, the most... Like, this is just so interesting because I love, I love stuff like this. I love... Um, Understanding how Fleming wrote because I actually did a um, <laughs> one of my like I think my sophomore year of uh, university I wrote a massive paper like a thesis on on um, the, something called the Fleming Hook. This is a bit of a tangent, but um, hey, it is very the, valuable information. The so Fleming I- book, <laughs> Fleming, Ian Fleming wrote his books in such an interesting way, um, and one of those techniques he uses something called the Fleming hook. It's not an official name. It's the one I used. Um, and it, it's, it's, you're, you're trademarking it, <laughs> trademarking that. Um, I, but he basically what he did is, and it borrows a lot from like serialized television. Um, every chapter ends with a tiny little cliffhanger. It's not necessarily like, um, doesn't have to be like bonds in peril. And then end of the paragraph and end of the chapter, next chapter starts. It's, it's just like, 
little things where he leaves a little detail incomplete and then completes it in the next in the next chapter, driving you through the book. So you 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 there's like you know that, that that sensation of not being able to put it down. A lot of Fleming's mm-hmm. books have that sort of. Uh, feeling because of the Fleming hook where he sort of and even paragraphs on a paragraph level he will um, sort of just push you along the story in very subtle very interesting ways and I think he's just a really really masterful writer um, and so it's really cool to see how he being this person that I really admire as a writer seeing how he basically worked through his drafts because I think any writer will tell you drafts are uh, something that no one thinks they have to do, but then always ends up doing sort of uh, inadvertently. Um, and so it's just it's just really cool to sort of see how he – and also just to see like what were his original ideas, what were editorials' ideas, what were like Kingsley Amos' ideas. Um, and yeah, because as we can see here um, in the in the transcripts, like – I mean we're not looking at them right now. But um, a lot of Kingsley Amos' suggestions were later adopted into the – the final story and so was that Fleming doing that or was that Kingsley Amis doing that on Fleming's behalf um these are sort of right. the questions so it, I guess the yeah. question is kind of still looming like is this confirmation that Amis actually finished the novel you know I, I, I mean when we know we don't know for sure I don't think we're ever going to know because Kingsley Amis no we probably never won't said. He, this is intentionally right. kept it like sort of quiet because he wanted to respect his you know, dead friend. Um, mm-hmm. And, but yeah, no, there's a lot of like really interesting stuff. I, I, I honestly, there's not so much I can do to, um, to relay this information, but there's just a lot of really interesting exchanges. Um, some a little not, um, there's like, there's a couple of things that are a little not uh, <laughs> entirely, there are other times anyway, like, um, mm-hmm. There's one bit where Amos sort of like notes. There's like a, there's like a hint of homosexuality in Scaramanga in the <laughs> in the way he fetishizes his pistol um, mm-hmm. that he he want, he kind of wanted Fleming to flesh out because he thought it was an interesting uh, direction to take the character. Um, and there's just little stuff like that where it's like, oh, that that is like that was deliberate. That is like sort of a something that was brought to Fleming's attention. Um, but you know, it is just again like there's little tidbits like this all through these uh, documents that I think are worth looking at um, to track them down. Um, there, there, there were a couple. There were a couple like scans online. Um, yeah, we got we we found uh, the one. We, we originally found out about it on what mi six dot com. It's like the James Bond. Uh, yes, like, yeah, mi six headquarters blog or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah, they they have all of like the latest news and stuff there. So that's a great place to go if you want to. Um, you know, be up to speed on all your Bond stuff, and that's yeah. where we found out about this manuscript. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think just again, like I, I don't want to go through and beat for beat tell you what's in these things. Uh, mm-hmm. I just think because it's kind of something I think people it, it, you get more out of it if you read through it um, if you have an interest in it. Um, yeah. But there is just a lot of really really cool stuff. So if you like Ian Fleming, if you like the process of book publishing, which is also a very uh, surprisingly cutthroat arena especially back in the day um yeah worth checking out worth just sort of seeing what was going through Ian Fleming's mind what was going through his editor's mind um yeah just just a lot of really really cool stuff um so cool yeah I mean <laughs> it's all I, cool. I, like I mean it's it's really fascinating I mean yeah, yeah. he's Bro- Brody's dead on you should read through it um especially for myself as someone who's not as in tune, I guess, with the novels as I, as someone who's a fan of James Bond, probably should be. Um, it, I, I even found it very, very fascinating just to yeah. kind of see the thought process that went behind um, the uh, Fleming's final story and such. So yeah, and all I, right. I, I was gonna say one more thing, just like that I found interesting that um, is just kind Go. of yep. a random aside. Um, very all over the place in this discussion, but um, another thing that like that Fleming is famous for that you sort of see being finely tuned in this draft is uh, Fleming is famously very terse in his writing. He, he doesn't, mm-hmm. he's a lot like um, Ernest Hemingway in that, like he just sort of doesn't beat around the bush with his like descriptions. He's very, um, he, he, well, Ian Fleming used to be a journalist, right? So he, mm-hmm. he sort of writes in a very journalistic manner. It's very matter of fact, same like mm-hmm. with, with um, Ernest Hemingway. They, they sort of report things in a very, it's very. It's kind of beautiful in the way of like how succinct it is, and 
you can see a lot of like changes in here where he sort of every now and then will vary like he'll stray from that sort of succinctness and the editor either him or his copy editor or anyone has gone through and just sort of crossed it out and said you know what you can just start here start the sentence here instead of like having this extra little bit of flowery prose and so stuff like that's really cool too because uh, as someone who likes to write stuff it's kind of nice to see that Ian Fleming even had trouble um maintaining his his own style so right, yeah, right a lot of really 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 interesting stuff um even if you don't like i mean why we listen to this podcast if you don't like bond but even if you don't like bond this is just an interesting <laughs> sort of uh thing to look at but uh yeah so that's all i had to say about that <laughs> sweet for sure no and i uh, you know even after we finish this do you want to continue on with q branch do you want to finish out this segment here i'll let oh, you take man. this man i get to finish you get to finish uh, <laughs> q branch you get to finish q branch this week this is a this is a treat brody this is oh, a real boy treat. oh you left me with the great the, the, the best stories of q branch um <laughs> <laughs> they're really um, more of announcements as of, opposed yeah, to stories like, okay so like welcome to the james bond um uh like mole i guess we're gonna tell you what you can buy <laughs> um, it's kind of like here oh, here you go you, your, get, you can choose from this or this or that one thing i, I should add really quick to the um, man with the golden gun story if you're in the market to buy these um you can buy these transcripts um from jonker's rare books for one uh one hundred and fifty thousand pounds so uh, there you if, you go. got, if you got one hundred fifty thousand pounds to spare just uh, casually laying around yeah just go buy that maybe you can also buy Goldeneye, um, which is actually a, f- a fun <laughs> fact. I have my, my lifelong goal has always been to earn enough money to buy Goldeneye. I would like to live there in my in my uh, twilight years. Well, um, now you've given a bunch of people who listen to this show yeah, an idea. Like, you guys better leave that alone because I've, I've called dibs. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think it belongs to like the Fleming um, the, the Fleming estate. But I'll buy it from them. I'll make them an offer they can't refuse. But um, you'll make, you'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> oh, there you go. Nice, excellent. Um, little cinematic reference there. To the yes, Godfather. of course. Um, always, always, always. But anyway, so um, jumping into our next story, uh, less of a story, more of a again an ad. Um, Becoming Bond, which we've talked about on this show before, uh, is a great mm-hmm. little documentary uh, about uh, George Lazenby and sort of his life leading up to becoming Bond um, and how that informed his experience as a uh, in the limelight Th- uh, that is actually coming out on home video oh god i just showed my age just now um home it's video home video you can find it <laughs> a blockbuster like um like oh my god um yeah no it's coming out on blu-ray and dvd rather um november 14th which is kind Woo-hoo. of like that's kind of a bond release date like november 14th yeah that's, it's uh, always, bond stuff is always coming out in november and it's always like the first couple of weeks in november so that yeah. that is a very fitting release date for this absolutely so if you haven't seen it maybe you can wait to go buy it on blu-ray and yeah exactly uh, i mean i know i'm bond definitely going to be picking that up i mean i i loved that documentary i so already good. if you if you have a hulu subscription or you are or even if you don't, just do the <laughs> trial, watch the watch the film, and then cancel your subscription. I mean, it's really, really there quite simple. Um, or you can oh wait boy, for the Oh, boy, we're not getting sponsored by Hulu. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. The, just gave this podcast game. is sponsored by Hulu. No. <laughs> Get the but, subscription for free and then quit. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're giving you all kinds of business, Hulu. But um, <laughs> it, it is really fantastic. I mean, I've never seen a documentary done like this before. It's almost like half documentary, half, like, actual film, film. <laughs> and yeah like there, there's like an actual narrative going on here in uh, George Lazenby's kind of you know narrating you through the whole story I mean we've already yeah. we've already talked about this on a few episodes back so if you want to go to the episode where we talk about becoming Bond um, just kind of like peruse Honestly, like around our past episodes two, look two, in the description um, we, we dive deep into that one yeah. and it is a really fantastic documentary probably one of the best ones I've seen this year, um, and really original, a really original approach to it. Absolutely, so. yeah. I oh no, yeah, I love it. Um, so yeah, for sure. Keep an eye out on that. Um, and now another ad, uh, a little less specific. Um, <laughs> this so, is for our friends in the UK. <laughs> yes, that's right. Most of these seem to be. Um, so if you're in London on November sixteenth, which is around the same time, um, check out Philharmonia Orchestra's "The Best of John Barry." Bond and Beyond concert, which is being held at the Royal Festival Hall. 
Um, so like basically, along with a, like a multitude of other uh, John Barry hits, uh, the Philharmonia Orchestra will be performing tracks from James Bond favorites such as Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Octopussy, and just other like a, a assorted James Bond sweet pieces. Um, so again, this is a kind of just a thing if you're in the area. But um, as like I think the both of us are very very into. Um, Film music, in particular, James Bond film music. Yeah, um, for sure. This would be a really, really cool thing to go. I wish I was in London uh, to see for this. For real, because I, you having know, missed, in, having missed the, uh, the Casino Royale concert, I was about to say yes, yeah, the Casino uh, Royale concert. I would have killed to have seen geez. that because they played the movie and then played the music along with the movie, and it was Which conducted so by cool. David Arnold. Oh, that's so. I mean, cool. that is yeah. like, oh my gosh! I actually had to buy a. Um, a shirt for the 10th anniversary of Casino Royale that they were selling. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, I had to do it. I saw it, they were like, we've got leftover shirts from the concert. And I was like, <laughs> I am buying that. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, no, because like, so yeah, if you're in the area um, and you don't know about this, check it out because it, it, it's going to be really cool. Like it, it just, that's a really interesting list of, uh, of songs, like of, of I guess of, um, John Barry uh, tracks, right? I guess right. It sort of it sort of takes. I mean, I don't know why there's no Living Daylights on there. Oh, um, I'm sure they'll play something from because that, considering but, you like because you pretty much hit every single beat. Otherwise, like Goldfinger's uh, old Goldfinger, you don't have twice. It's like early Barry. Then on a Majesty's Secret Service has like the synth Barry. Octopussy yeah, has the um, synth Barry, <laughs> and then um, and then Octopussy's kind of more classic, but late Roger Moore, where it had like. A very particular sound to it, and then mm. yeah, all it's missing is like Living Daylights, which is a little more synth Barry, but like more eighties. Eighties Barry, yeah. And so like I think that would have been a nice like like uh, overture of his um, of his time in Bond. But oh, I'm still, sure they'll play. Living I'm sure they'll Daylights play something. Or something. Yeah, um, for sure. So yeah, go, maybe you can go and let us know. But um, yes, yeah, please. very very cool. So check that out. And then there's one more thing, um, less of an ad this time, but this is just a fun fact um, that I probably should have check the date for um <laughs> so the, uh, Brody is ill prepared this episode what an absolute shit show um but basically um the day of the dead festival in mexico city has uh, kind of seen a resurgence lately um mainly in part due to i mean obviously it was a big festival in, in mexico but um they've started doing these parades through mexico city um, after Spectre. So, because like, for Spectre, they, they did a big Day of the Dead parade, and they, obviously from the opening scene, and they filmed it, and it was just so elaborate, so many extras, so many costumes, and like the, the mm-hmm. skull masks and stuff like that. And apparently, the city of New, of, um, I was say New Mexico, of Mexico City, <laughs> uh, said they liked this tradition a lot, and they've sort of just kept it going. So now, because of Bond, we have a big parade in the, in Mexico City, which is really, really cool. Which, and, that's just, that's just awesome. This is, I mean, yeah. like, you know, it's kind of silly to say that a film franchise has affected you know communities like this but it's pretty yeah, evident no, when you look sure, at some yeah. of the stuff you know i mean obviously london there's a lot of things in the uk that are heavily you know that bond has clearly uh had an effect on i mean even over here in the united states um we have a portion of the international spy museum in washington dc that is yeah. actually dedicated to james bond because oh, of its, great, oh. its <laughs> icon status and so yeah. you look at something like this that occurred while they were filming um, and, and the people in the community just loved it so much that they're like, you know what? We're going to make this a tradition. I just think that that is just – that is awesome. That is that so is, cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and so like the dates for anyone who's maybe in Mexico or heading to Mexico, um, apparently the, 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 the festival goes from October 31st to November 2nd. And so I'm assuming it will be sometime in that week that they do the big parade um, in, uh, in, in Mexico City. Mm. But yeah, it's just – at some point, it's a little, it's a little new thing to add to your James Bond pilgrimage. If you're ever uh, hitting up like like James Bond locales and stuff like that, which I've something I've always wanted to do if I had the money. Um, oh, absolutely! Is, this is a new yeah. thing, a new little, uh, uh, a little location where they're doing something that is directly referencing, or definitely in, de- directly inspired by the James Bond films. So yeah, like you said, yeah. that's just a really yeah. cool thing to see the, the franchise affecting the world in this way, in a very tangible, real way. Um, yeah, yeah, and so and it's cool that like the, 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 
Because I, I don't know, I don't know why they've never done that before in Mexico City. You feel like it's mm-hmm. such a big holiday, but right. I mean, it feels like it would make sense. I mean, I, I know yeah. they had a celebration and stuff like that, but I guess that specific parade they've just mm-hmm. never done before. So of it's kind of yeah, cool yeah. to see. Yeah, something we like didn't that invent happened. the Day of the Dead. Let's just be clear. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, so check that out in um, end of October. So you've got a couple days if you want to do that. But um, anyway, there you go. That uh, I guess does it for Q Branch, which has been sponsored by Hulu. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and the um, very good Royal Festival Hall in London. So um, <laughs> there we go, there we go, Brody. Great job on Thank doing uh, Q Branch here. I know oh, it was a little I difficult graduated. for you. You're not used to doing it, but except for the I'm, two episodes I did by myself, like <laughs> right, right. That's right. So I guess you do have a little bit of experience. You, you, you've moved on. You've moved away from Pampers. You're now in child sized underwear. So that's whoa. Good. I can shit myself on the go. Um, <laughs> whoa, a potty train. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have the um? I don't know. Do you guys have? Because I know Pampers and Snuggies are the same brand, but just like in di- like they have a different name uh, mm-hmm. depending on where you're from. But um, in in Australia, the Pampers uh, equivalent, which is Snuggies, has like a jingle that's like "I'm a big kid now." Do yeah, you have that? yeah, we okay, have that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, that's I am a big kid now, so this is awesome. How, you are. I can't believe you in <laughs> in the entire like what three years you've lived in the United States now. I can't believe you've never heard that jingle. Yeah, I don't watch a lot of commercial TV, surprisingly. So yeah. it's, you uh, watch a lot of Hulu, right? That's right. This episode yeah. is sponsored by Hulu, right? Wonderful, wonderful free month of Hulu, and then I canceled. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, I have Hulu through the uh, student deal, actually. So that's pretty nice. Oh yes, um, you get it with Spotify now. Yes, it's amazing. Right. But, um, so there's no excuse for you to not watch Becoming Bond now. That's true. Yes. Um, I mean, I've seen it, but other other students have no excuse. But, right, um, right, exactly. Anyway, so yes, I'm a big kid and I ended my Q branch segment. What are we going to next, Griffin? Perfect. So now it is time to move on to Shaken But Heard. No oh, no good. uh no brother from Langley this week. We toyed around with discussing the foreigner, but you know what? We did it at the beginning. We and there's really not much else one. to say. Yeah. You know, yeah. Martin Campbell, Pierce Brosnan teamed up, you know, we've already touched on that a little bit. So no next brother results. from Langley this week. <laughs> um maybe we'll have one next week, depends on the topics. But we're moving on to Shaken But Heard. This is our discussion segment where we pick a topic that sounds really interesting or is relevant yes. to any of the stuff we previously talked about in the episode. The topic we picked for this week is really kind of funny because we were planning out the show and I started humming a Bond song. I'm not going to tell you what that song is because we'll probably touch on it <laughs> later on. Um, and Brody totally. was like, oh God, I hate that song. Ugh. And so we, we got into this whole argument about like worst Bond songs and stuff like that. So we're like, you know, we were trying to figure out a topic to discuss in this segment and we finally settled on the top 10 worst Bond songs. Yeah, So not? it's very random, um, but it's always fun to talk about the songs behind Honestly, the yeah. films. And it's because the there's... Yeah, and the thing is, like, I'm just, like, adding on to what you were just saying um, real mm-hmm. quick. It is funny because... I guess it, it probably comes across really random for everyone listening, but mm-hmm. literally every time we do this episode, like we do the show, uh, beforehand one of us will be humming a Bond song or something. Oh, it is very and yeah. That is usually, not a, that is not an usually not yeah. a not not a great one. Usually one that like like is aggravating to the other person listening. So that is where <laughs> this this list came from. Uh, it is just purely because it is. Const- we're constantly thinking about this when we do th- these episodes, and so we really are. We really might are. as well integrate it into the show itself. Yes, but, uh, exactly. Might as well. <laughs> so we're going to do the top ten worst Bond songs. Now, just before we dive into this, this is a very subjective list. We understand that oh, everyone yeah. has their own opinions Disclaimer on time. what are the best Bond songs, what are the worst Bond songs. So there are going to be some songs in here that you may not agree with, oh, and yeah. that's okay. That's the beauty of this. This whole thing is subjective. <laughs> we can have our own respective list. Mainly, this is just my plea to not send me. <laughs> death threats yes. because my the bottom half of my list is going to anger some people i understand a, i hear you the death threats i i yeah, I, I, own, I, <laughs> I own this list 100 you're all wrong if you don't agree uh, oh my god <laughs> no but just we were just prefacing by saying this these are our respective lists we understand yours might be different and we yeah. actually encourage you to share your lists in the comment section of wherever you're watching um, so without yeah. further ado let's dive into this the top 10 worst bond songs um Brody, how do you want to break this up? Do you just want to trade one a piece, or do you want to take it segment by segment and kind of discuss? Let's do segment by segment, just because I feel like we're gonna there's gonna be overlap on some of these songs, and we end up yeah. like I think unlike when we've done the episode, like the TV shows and oh, TV shows, fuck uh, the movies and stuff like that, the, the lists. Mm-hmm. There's been so much overlap that we can kind of just like get into it 
on each movie yeah. instead of like like oh mine that's the next one on my list so I'll just talk about it now. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to be the case of this one. So we this might going to well be very just, different. Yeah. Yes. So we might yeah. Okay. Break so it down do you, segment by segment. Let's let's do uh, ten through six. You'll do your ten through six. I'll do my ten through six, and then you'll do your five through two, and then I'll do my five through two, and then we'll both reveal our uh, number one at the end. Yeah, sounds good. All right, I will let you have the floor first. So, Brody, what is your ten through six? <laughs> oh, I just split the list into like in, in half, pretty much. And um, time to get mad. You're not gonna like what ended up in the in the, in the top of the upper echelon of terrible. Um, mm, mm. But anyway, so um, this one it was really hard. The number my number ten was really hard. Um, it's you only live twice, which. It's a song I like. What? It's you a song I, sociopath. <laughs> it's a song I like, right? It's I like it. I feel like I've always told myself this is I would dance to You Don't Live Twice at my wedding. Um, I always feel like it's like <laughs> and it's, it's, yet it's, it's, it's number beautiful. 10 on your top well, 10 like, worst it's, bond it's, it's songs. 24 and this is like about halfway <laughs> through that list a little less, but um <laughs> So I, I, it was just the the, the, the next the, all the other ones are just so good. They were so I, I was debating between this and the Living Daylights, and I decided. Are you kidding I, me? I love the Living Daylights. When I listened to it, like I, I played it and just like I was like, oh wait, I know I can't put this on the list. Wow, um, and wow. So, You're only twice oh, is wow. a good song, a beautiful song. Um, kind of a little. I just don't listen to it as much. Um, it's just a little uninteresting sometimes. Um. It's still beautiful. The strings are really, really nice in it. Um, Nancy Sinatra is a wonderful singer, obviously. But oh, yeah. I just don't come back to it as much as I do some of the other Bond songs. So for that reason, it's number 10. Um, I, I, I get that one's controversial. I get that one's a really like beloved song. I love it too. But yeah, yeah. Bit, it, big, it is good. A it's big beautiful. preface. And a lot of these songs, especially this top half, I like. I like these songs in the top half of my oh, for sure. bottom 10. Right, it's right. just they had to be – they had to fall somewhere on the list. Right, um, especially when we're me, doing a top 10 and there's 24 movies. Obviously, the ones towards the bottom of this top 10 list – are going to be, you know, yeah. uh, I don't really hate it, but like it has to fall here. Yes, exactly. And so that brings me to my number nine, which is Writings on the Wall by Sam Smith. You kill um, me. I love that song, man. I get it. You know, I get it. it but, I, I, yeah. I, I do. I, I really do get it because it is very slow. His his falsetto either jives with you or it doesn't. I just, I, I think it's that song is beautiful. I absolutely yeah, love it. 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 The, the falsetto, that's what does it for me. Um, it, it is a really nice song. I love the melody. Mm-hmm. Like, the strings. Oh. Very, very cool. When I, I, just, I just remember, um, I think what did it for me is I remember, and this, this is probably my own fault, but remember when they when they announced the song? Because originally, when I, when I saw Skyfall, I just avoided the song altogether. And then yeah. I ended up accidentally hearing it, and so I just... Like I overheard it while I was mowing the lawn. I heard someone listening to it on the radio, <laughs> and uh, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I just ran inside and I listened to it. Um, yeah, because I, I needed to hear it properly. But um, so I gave up on that with Spectre. I was like, "Ah, fuck it! I'm not gonna be able to avoid this song, especially if it charts." So I'm just gonna listen mm-hmm. to it. And so and I did end up doing really well. So um, when they when they did that first, like the day before it came out, they did the the little like teaser, the little stinger, and. Um, and it just—it was just that opening, like with the brass, wah, 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 wah. and I heard that. Yeah. And I was just like, "Wow, that is fucking amazing!" That's like, I, and then I set myself up to hear like. So your um, expectations skyrocketed. My, my yeah. expectations were like, "Oh, this is gonna be like a." a t- I mean, no, I, no, I did have to put in the back of my mind that Sam Smith is like a hit or miss artist for me, but um. <sighs> yeah, I get, and, I get why people don't. But like I, I was like, "Oh, this sounds like a Tom Jones kind of song. This is beautiful," and then. I heard it and it was good. It was good, but it was just like the falsetto, like because he's he's got a good singing voice. But then when he hits the falsetto, it's like this doesn't feel right. This doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound bad. Yeah, some just doesn't sound yeah. right. And um, this is a couple of points. I mean, and it is one of my most referenced songs. I have a friend who um, we constantly like just text each other lyrics from this song. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like yeah, yeah it's just completely unannounced. I'll be like, I'll just like I'll text Jeff and I'll be like, like, like um, when you're not here, I'm suffocating. So stuff like that, um, <laughs> just to take this take, take the piss a little bit. But um, it's but it, 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 so I, I do listen to it somewhat. But I don't know, it just doesn't. It, I don't know. It just doesn't sound right. Um, and, you know, that's that's like one of the ones where like if it's on your top ten worst, I completely understand. I just I think it's so. Be- I just love it. I, I really and I think it gets a lot more hate than it deserves. But it I does. I, I yes, would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I think it's everyone like overreacted. I I, I, I get that the falsetto is bad. Not bad, but I get that it's not 
Bondian, but it's not like he's a terrible singer like some of the other songs on this list. But um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So yeah, Sam Smith is a very talented man, and I wouldn't want to. Um, although he did make an ass of himself at the Oscars when he said he was the only gay man to ever won an, win an Oscar. But um, and I was like, you're embarrassing Bond right now. Don't do this. Don't say that. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Be like Adele. Just take the take the award. Be thankful and leave. Like yeah. But, um, anyway, yeah. so uh, lingered on that one for a bit. Uh, next one, in number eight is License to Kill. Um, which okay. is a song I really like. Again, I really like this yeah. song, but I it's this it's on the list because it is just the melody to Goldfinger, um, but like jazzed up a little bit. And mm-hmm. it, I mean, it's catchy. I love listening to it, but I never like. I have to be in the mood to listen to it, and it just kind of. Yeah, I don't know. Just it's too similar to Goldfinger. It's a little uninspired in that way, um, which is a shame because I think uh, Gladys Knight is a really, really great singer. Um, mm-hmm. There's an interesting story I was telling you about how um, she didn't want to sing the song initially because she didn't like the idea of referencing murder, and they, they they said like, okay, you can change it to be like you know killer as in like you know lady killer like you know go for the heart you know what I mean and that's yeah, the, that's the yeah. way they got her to agree to do the song which I think is an interesting story um, a little strange but it's strange that she would agree to do a Bond song and then say oh I can't reference death I know not, like, like you know <laughs> knowing what like the, the material is about so uh, for a movie called License to Kill for real um, yeah <laughs> yeah I mean granted it was called License Revoked for a while but um, and that would have been a really hard song to sing too License Revoked like it would have oh, been oh god that would have been odd. gross that would have been really awkward. But anyway, yeah, so that's another one. Um, ah, you know, I hate that this is higher than License to Kill. But um, <laughs> number seven is All Time High. Um, we are going to come back to both of those on my list. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. You're not uh, alone. All Time High is um, – I, re- I actually really like this song. It's a guilty pleasure song. Uh, Rita Coolidge. Uh, apparently, Rita Coolidge was only hired because – Barbara Broccoli, when she was, like, young, when this movie was being made, she said, hey, Dad, can you get Rita Coolidge to do a Bond song? Because I think she's cool. And so then they got her. <laughs> like, that's the whole reason that she does it. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of forgettable, but it is... I, I, that's my I, problem with it, yeah. When I listen to it, I, I really do get into it. It's like, you know, oh, we're on all time high. It's a really cool song for Bond and Octopussy's relationship, I think. And I love when, I, like, when John Barry incorporates that, that melody into the, into the score. It, like... It actually does have some weight, and so it's nice. Um, mm-hmm. That's about all I have to say. Not, not a lot to say about all time high. Um, and then Die Another Day, which everyone thinks should be wow. lower on this list. Wow. But, um, Die Another Day is a guilty, guilty pleasure of mine. Um, oh, wow. For many that reasons. Is, <clears throat> that's really, really low Yeah, uh, for but, that but, song. <laughs> but should, everyone thinks, everyone, but everyone thinks it should be like, like – the worst and i don't think it's the worst right. so i think i still think it's high on my list comparatively um i just it's not a very good bond song um it's it, it like i think we, you're gonna get to this when you talk about it. like the strings definitely did save it a lot um it, it's just not very bondian but as a song i enjoy it a little bit and it's another like another running joke i have with with people where that i we will I'll say like, oh, put a song on, and then I'll put on Dying on the Day just to fuck with me. And I think, <laughs> I think because that has happened so frequently in my life, um, I've just ended up embracing the song. And um, right for its now, like silliness. Now, now, yeah, now it's less ironic. I actually kind of enjoy a little bit of it. Um, it's it's a bad, good dance song, I guess. And mm-hmm. um, I, I also I was like, I I think it sort of mirrors my entire reaction to Dying on the Day. I used to really hate Dying on the Day. Um, but I've come around on it a little bit. It's it's dumb, mm-hmm. um, but now everyone says it's like the worst ever, and it's not the worst. I, ever. I, I don't agree it's... with that. I I actually really like the first half of that movie. I mean, there's yeah. some like elements that are silly, but I actually think the first half of that movie is pretty solid. Yeah, and I think I, I, a lot of I, there's, a, there's a very um, this is, without getting into details on like the whole story because every Bond thing I say on this show has a fucking story to it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just tied to so much of my life, I guess. But um, Die Another Day as a movie and as a song is tied to a very special time in my life a very special person in my life and so it is interesting that i have softened on that movie and softened on this song uh because 
if you had asked me this five years ago, I would have said it's the worst song. It's unlistenable, and that movie is <laughs> almost as bad as Dying of the Day. And so, Dying is a Forever. Sorry. And now, whoa! I, um, but now I've softened on it a lot, and I think it's not that bad. It's got it, it's enjoyable in a pulpy, dumb kind of way. And the same with the song. So yeah, that's my top. Uh, that's my bottom. Well, uh, this is such a fucking hard thing to say. Your ten through six. That's my ten through six. There we go. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So okay. what about you, Griffin? What's your ten through six? All right. Well. So far on our 10 through 6, we have one that is in common, and that just happens, <laughs> not not like as far as position goes, but in, in, in the 10 through 6. Um, and that is actually my number 10. My number 10 is License to Kill. Now, my bottom License two, I want to make this very clear. Kill. Yes, my bottom two, I actually think are good songs. So it's kind okay. of shitty for me to put this on the top 10 worst Bond songs. It's just when I'm looking at all the songs, and you got to put two at the bottom, that's just where they're going to go. you got to do what um, you got to do, yeah. And actually, I toyed around with License to Kill being one higher than this because my number nine is a classic song. It's very revered, and I understand all of the reasons why. But it ultimately came down to, if I'm going to listen to one of these two, which am I going to listen to more? And it's going to be License to Kill. Because even though it is essentially a Goldfinger ripoff, it is Goldfinger for a new generation. And it's got a more modernistic (laughs) take on it. And yeah, I just enough. love that fair about enough. it. It's got yeah, yeah. my only issue with it is the chorus is a little eh, lame, I guess you could <laughs> say. With like the rest of the song, the way it starts out, the ba 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 na 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 na, like that whole thing. I yeah. love but that you mean, element. You mean to the it. Goldfinger horns? Yeah. Yes, the Goldfinger if element only, of this song. That, if only that part of the song was attached to a better song. If only. Um, <laughs> but I guess we'll never know. Well, there's there's a reason that this song is number ten on the top ten worst and not the oh, best. Oh boy. Um, but I just <laughs> I I like the song. I like what Gladys Knight did with it. Uh, it was it's very eighties. But it's not overly 80s, I guess. It's kind of got like that 80s ballad to it, but it's got like the Goldfinger uh, classic horns to it. So just all around, very enjoyable song. Um, it's just when I look at the rest of the Bond songs, it is kind of a ripoff. So therefore, I got to put it on the list for that, for just kind of a lack of creativity, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so that goes at number 10. My number nine. Oh, oh I really you hope go. you guys don't kill me for this one. Oh, no. This is beautiful. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful song. Oh, and no. I think it perfectly encapsulates um, everything that has to do with this bond and the relationship. And that is Nobody Does It Better by Carly Simon. Oh, no. I knew it. Oh, no. Beautiful song. It oh. really is. It's a beautiful song. And I, I love um, that it was made. And I think it's very fitting for the movie. It's just... It's not one I'm particularly drawn to, much in the same way that you don't really care for writings on the wall. I just find mm-hmm. this one to be, um, it, it's meaningful, it's impactful, it's very revered because it is, you know, it's kind of like Roger Moore's swan song, if you will, even though it's clearly not, I mean, he did many more movies after that. I mean, um, it's, the, it's the song, like, well, yeah, the, 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 everyone plays over the montage of Roger Moore, and especially now that he's passed, um, it is a... Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And it's just kind of, I, I, I don't know. There's just something to it that doesn't necessarily resonate with me. Maybe it's because I didn't grow up uh, with The Spy Who Loved Me. I mean, I grew mm-hmm. up, I mean, I watched it growing up, but I didn't, I wasn't like born in that era. Yeah. Um, I just think that there are better songs that capture the same kind of feeling that you get with that one. Um, I guess I just feel that it's more of a song for Anya or Agent Triple X, if you will. Um, yes. As opposed to a song for Roger Moore um, and his Bond. I, it's just kind of the vibe I get while watching it. And maybe that's the point, because she is such an integral part of that movie. But yeah. f- for me, I just there are, there are songs I prefer more. I still think it's beautiful. I think it's a great song, as I mentioned at the beginning. It's just, it's not one that I always go back to to listen to. So that's Oof. why it's uh, at... At number nine, um, almost unforgivable, but I'll give you a pass. You <laughs> well, you're gonna for, you give me a pass for you and live twice, so that's your one pass. You get one pass for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to break Sorry, it to you, um, but number uh, number eight and seven are about to blow the doors off your anger. Um, oh no! So coming in at number eight is the Living Daylights, oh. and. I got to I got to say it's just very forgettable. You know, I, I live in there's there's daylights. elements there there are reasons why I like this song, um but then there's reasons why I don't. And I think ultimately 
it's forgettable. It's more of like aha trying to do a pop song than it is a Bond song. Yeah. That's one of my big issues with it. Um, but I will say what this song does do very well. Um, and actually, it, this is all credit to John Barry for this. Is this is one of the, the Living Daylights as a whole is one of the few movies where the song is so well integrated throughout the entire score and i respect it for that Mm -hmm. and and, in that in in the melody i guess you could say in that regard is memorable but it's the melody in the score that's memorable not necessarily the song um same melody though (laughs) and that's my and that's my big problem with it fair enough the living daylights is just very forgettable it's kind of like it's kind of like aha trying to ride the same boat that duran duran did absolutely Um, that's that's the whole reason they were hired yeah it's exactly because because that song was so successful they're like can we get another 80s band let's like oh and it it it, it, it feels like that um unfortunately (laughs) that's gonna lead me to my number seven because i thought that Uh aha actually did it better um Number no. seven is a view to a kill. Nobody does it better than Duran Duran. Let me tell you that, guys. I got, I got to, I got to be honest here. I have never been the biggest fan of the song "A View to a Kill." Oh. I, I get it's got its following. I get people love it. I get this is probably people's favorite Bond song, and there are elements to it that I do like, like oh, the the so like good. the ba 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 ba, like that whole thing. That's yeah. very you know modern like you see that stuff integrated in Goldeneye which I, I found to be pretty cool but yeah. um my my biggest issue with it is it is Duran Duran just making an 80s pop song they're not making a Bond song oh, it's almost my favorite and part. that's that's just <laughs> what it is you know I first of all Duran Duran is a very weird choice to tackle a Bond song I get it they were big in the 80s and they were they're a huge group like Are people you, love them do you want to know like, why they were picked it's interesting, Why? actually. So, like, um, basically what they did was um, – so when Duran Duran formed, uh, a big part of their, their image, I guess, was, like, the James Bond pop stars in mm-hmm. that, like, all of their music videos for MTV were deliberately – they said, like, okay, we want this music video to look like a James Bond movie. And so all hmm. of their – all of the, the aesthetic of all of their um, their videos is very, like, sort of – James Bond, and uh, they also sing a lot about like women and beautiful like women and all sort of stuff. And so they had, they, had, they had like that whole culture surrounding right, them. So that right. when they showed up, well, I think I they, were a, in that, they were at a party you, with um, with Cubby Broccoli and someone else, and um, and they said they sort of approached them and said, "Hey, can we do a Bond song?" And they're like, "Okay." <laughs> and so yeah, but anyway, continue. Um, no, I will, and I guess if you look at it through that lens, it makes sense why they were approached to do a Bond song. However. I feel them, yeah. that when an artist is approached to do a Bond song, they need to service the franchise and not what would make a popular tune. And that, and there are several other ones that are higher up on this list that um, I, I have an issue with for for a similar reason. Uh, only the song ended up being much worse. <laughs> a view to a kill. Is it a bad kill. song? No, it is a Absolutely good pop not. song. Is it a good Bond song? For me personally, no. I understand it has its fans. I understand people love it. I understand I'm going to get a lot of shit for this because this is a lot of people's favorite song. But <laughs> it's just, it's Duran Duran doing a pop song, not Duran Duran doing a Bond song. And I don't, I don't necessarily like it. Also, the lyrics are really weird. They <laughs> don't really make sense. Oh, it's a amazing. whole lot of sense. <laughs> I mean, so a lot of good. a lot of Bond songs, the lyrics are just kind of like forcibly weaved in there to just throw this, the title of the movie in. But I, I think oh, that's especially true. Um, in this one, and, and I'm not taking away points for that. I mean, <laughs> it's just kind of like another thing that's just like eh, you know. several decades later, I still don't understand fully what he's saying in that song. Like it's it's like some of the words are just so hard to make out. Yeah, and then and when you and then when you do make them out, they make no sense. So it's like, what's the point? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is, I but know it's, exactly. It's great. It's but, great. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. The, it's 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 a little it's catchy. A but lover's it's just, rosy stain is one it, of the words. Oh, yeah, it's, it's just a so very great. 80s, tingy pop song. But anyways, yeah. so that's why A View to Kill is at number seven. I'm sorry to have offended, uh, <laughs> have offended all of you. Um, <laughs> but I know this next one, many of you will agree with me on. Um, number six is Moonraker by Shirley Bassey. Ooh. Um, I like the song. I think it's a very classic, smooth Bond song, very fitting. Um, however, it is probably Shirley Bassey just kind of not going 100% in. Um, and the song say that. is say that. pretty boring. Um, you know, it's... I, I like it. I find it beautiful. But also, at the same time, it's not one I'm going to listen to 
really ever because it is just boring. But when it is played in the movie, I'm like, oh, it's very fitting. The melody, it makes you feel as though you're in space and stuff like that. But it's also, Shirley Bassey has done incredible Bond songs. This is just very below average, very subpar. Um, and like I said, it kind of lulls you to sleep. It's a very nice lullaby, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 no, for um, sure. So... <laughs> <laughs> Don't have a lot to say about Moonraker. It is a little forgettable too. I have I, I have to admit, even though I like it, you know, um, it is it isn't great. So that's why Moonraker is at uh, number six. All right. Hopefully, the rest of my list, you guys will just agree with me on and, and won't have to kill. <laughs> I, I, the the most controversial part of my list is out of the way. Oh so. boy. There mine, we go. I don't know if mine is yet. I don't know. No, we haven't reached your stride yet. Yeah. Um. So should I be doing all of them? Should I do my number one as well? No, just five through two. Just five, five through, through two. two. Okay. Well, we're gonna start with like off to the races. Uh, my number five is Tomorrow Never Dies. Fuck which off. Which is a oh. ter- which is a terrible, terrible song. Um, no, it's not. It's, it's not it's like compared not. to especially like I mean, it has the the the, the misfortune. But you have to. I, I get it. It has I the get, misfortune I get the of. Whole, <laughs> I, uh, it has the misfortune of being the replacement for Surrender, which is by far and away one of the best songs ever written for a Bond movie. Um, you're right. You're right. So it has high, a high standard it has to live up to, and it fails miserably. But also <laughs> Cheryl Crow um, is a mediocre singer. She's not a bad singer. Uh, she's very much a pop. She's very much a pop singer. And so when she tries to hit those high, like like Shirley Bassey kind of notes, which the song sort of forces on her. Um, because it wants to sound like a Bond song. So when she tries to hit those high notes and like those long, long like holds, she doesn't know how to do it. And it, it, it's just a little embarrassing. See, like I um, actually disagree with that. Like when you listen to it, <laughs> if you listen very carefully, she does hit the notes. Like I, at least I, I mean, kind of, kind of like in a very like sort of, she's trying so hard and her voice sounds so well, In a very 90s like, singer kind of way I mean the song is a product maybe, of the 90s maybe, and she definitely has I mean, that style in her voice it's, it's like if the problem is they should have got her to sing a song that was within her range if you know what I mean like if they'd wanted a yeah, song that, if they wanted a song to hit those Bond like like notes they should have got Katie Lang's song. You know what I mean? Like, because she can hit right. those notes. But uh, I mean, I, Crow, I am in agreement with you there. Surrender like, is a much better song. It should have been oh, a Bond yeah, song, yeah. Um, but it wasn't chosen. So just if you and I know it's very hard to separate that from this whole oh, yeah, debacle. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do. A lot it's of people. Like, um, it's just I don't know. Like every time I listen to it, I, I and this is divorced from the fact that it is replacing Surrender. It just doesn't work for me. Like, um, what's the one bit that I, I constantly sing to you that um, is quite what funny? The, until the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> until the day. So can I hit that note? And it's um, and it's just awkward. It sounds like chalk, like like fingers on a chalkboard. It's like really. Unpleasant. Oh, that's an extreme no, no, to me, exaggeration. To me, to me, it does though. It really, it, it's really unpleasant. And so, uh. um, and it's, yeah, it's just like you know. Yeah, you can have your cynical cash grab and you can replace Katie Lang with a more attractive uh, contemporary artist, but don't <laughs> force a song that she cannot sing onto her because it just... Because the lyrics are fine. The melody is really cool. That, um, the, the dun, 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 dun. Dude, the That's song really, really is great. so Bond, man. It, it is really so Bond. is. It is so Bond, but then she just lets me down. And, and, and it, it, honestly, it, it annoys me enough to put it this low. And a, a little bit well, to do with Surrender but... and a little, a, lot of it, uh, a little bit to do with um, Katie Lang and a lot of it's to do with um, the fact that I just don't like her singing. Um, Killing so then me. Killing number me four, number four is Another Way to Die. Um, yeah. yeah, it's got to be on here. It's got to be on here. Um, it's it's objectively, like I think, and I will explain this to you before. The way my, my metholo- methodology for making this list is not so much is it a bad song or is it a good song or is it a good James Bond song or is it a bad James Bond song? Because I mean, those are all factors that play into it. But is it a song mm-hmm. that I enjoy listening to? And is it a song that suits the movie? And Another Way to Die doesn't suit its movie. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> is terrible, maybe one of the worst constructed songs on this list. I, I would have to agree um, with that, yeah. Because it, it, when we've discussed this at nauseum before, I don't know if we've done it on the show before, but we've definitely done it in, in private. Um, 
whoever thought Alicia Keys and Jack White could harmonize such should a be weird fired. combo. Such a weird combo. I don't know how it happened because I, yeah. I can't imagine Jack White being like, I need to work with Alicia Keys. I can't imagine Alicia Keys being like, I need Jack White. And then I, know, it's I, like can't, the, imagine, you, I can't imagine some <laughs> producer saying, we need to put these two together. They're made for each other. <laughs> this so is like, a match made in heaven. Yeah. And so like, who came up with this pairing? It's so dumb. And so, because and an Alicia Keys Bond song would have been great. And a Jack White Bond song could have been great. But right, right. It, they don't belong together. And no, so, not at all. And so, yeah, and then, then there's a lot of weird, weird parts in the song where, like, Alicia Keys is just screaming, and the, also the lyrics are, are, are like they're not they make sense, but then shoot em up, bang bang. Yeah, and there's like, it's like but then they're, they're also just like they make sense, but they're just not good. Is the problem? They're yeah, just really up, bad. It's like shoot em up, it's bang, like bang. a 15 year old just like wrote or not yeah. 15, probably like more like a 12 year old just wrote up a bunch of angst that he was feeling like it was shoot so, em up. It's so angsty. There's a thing. It's like because um, there's another not line in a good in the way either. No, no, no. But like in this, there's one bit in the song where it's like um, she's like I think it's Alicia Keys. Um, is she's I have to listen to it again to like be sure. But um, pretty sure it's Alicia Keys verse. But um, she's talking about things that you cannot trust, right? And then she she gets the one part. And she goes, <laughs> "A man on your side," and it's like, okay, we get it. But first of all, it doesn't make any sense because in terms of like the Bond story, the one thing Bond cannot trust is a woman on his side. That's the whole point of Casino Royale is that yeah. you can't trust women after after Vespa. And yet you changed it to make it like get a man on your side. And also funnily well, they enough. Want, they didn't want to be um, sexist. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. But it's like it's it was just like that it goes so counter to what the whole point of, of Quantum of Solace is as a movie. Um, and on top of that, um, it's really hard to make out what she's saying sometimes. Like that, well, it's hard to make the, out what uh, all of what both of them yeah, are saying. Yeah. Really, oh, and, no, I mean, sure, not to yeah. mention the awful harmonies. I mean, my god, the, the harmonies are terrible. Um, there's a bit where like um, with Jack White spasming on the guitar, and it just doesn't sound very good. Um, uh, like I, like, I kind of like Jack, Jack White's guitar riffs, and but that. Um, they're fine, I guess. But um, interestingly enough, my parents actually kind of like this song. Um, like yeah, my, I my had, dad, my dad's more of like a like a rock and roll guy, so he kind of like digs this one. But um, I just don't get it. And anyway, look, 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 going back to the incomprehensible um, lyrics, <laughs> I remember like as kids, my brother and I, um, or however I don't know if you call us kids when this came out. I don't know, but um, two thousand eight when this first came out, we constantly, we, we were a little immature, so we heard um, Man on Your Side and it sounded like Man on Your Sack and I was like, ha ha ha! <laughs> and we, we, we thought that was so funny um, and so now every time I hear the song in the back of my mind, I have to like it's not Man on Your Sack, it's not Man on Your Sack, it's not Man on Your Sack, but um, <laughs> Man on Your Sack. Which I think is really funny but anyway, yeah. so the, Another Way to Die uh, is number four and for good reason, it's not very good. Fair, um, yeah. another, another Way to Not Be Good. And and um, I think and this is another thing. Um, this one less so than Surrender, but um, the uh, No Good About Goodbye by Shirley Bassey that was done for this movie. In, like, oh my instead, God, so is great. A beautiful, haunting song that should have been the Bond song for Quantum of Solace. And they um, used the Vesper melody. It used, yeah, exactly. It's so beautiful. I mean, David Arnold wrote it with Shirley Bassey. Uh, it is such a wonderful song. Um, would have been a nice way to Shirley Bassey to bring her I think Bond the, contributions back. I think back. the producers were just but, drunk at this point. They were just like, oh, you, no, no, we, she's done enough. It was Jack yeah, White, Alicia, Jack, Keys. Alicia Keys. Like, let's put them all together. Yeah, like, like none of this, none of these decisions make sense. Bob, you're drunk. No. You're drunk. Stop getting wine drunk in the studio. But um, <laughs> it's uh, but anyway, speaking of uh, Shirley Bassey, um. The next song on my list, number three, is Moonraker. Moonraker is a boring song. Um, it is. That yeah, is the big problem is. with it. Moonraker is a boring song that no one who wrote it or sang it cared about. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, at this point, th th this is like the lull in John Barry's contribution to the Bond franchise where he was just sort of like just going through the motions. And so he's like, all right, I'll write a Bond song about the moon. Moonraker, fine. He writes it, the can't moon. find anyone to sing it. <laughs> and he's like, hey, Shirley... Uh, my good friend, would you like to do me a favor and sing this song? And then she's like, all right, it pays. And then she did it. And you can tell no one gives a shit about this song because Shirley Bassey <laughs> doesn't sound like she's into it when she's singing it. The lyrics sound like John Barry didn't care about when he wrote it. Um, it's just 
average. It's boring. It's a much better song. It's, it's a better constructed song than Another Way to Die. It's a better sung song than Tomorrow Never Dies. But hey, hey, come on, there. I mean, come on, yeah, come on. Shirley Bassey's a better singer than Cheryl Crow. Give me that. Yeah, come but on. the song is Tomorrow Never Dies as a song is much better I mean, than I mean, Moonraker. Better, but it's a it's a better sang song is what I mean. Like Shirley Bassey's a better singer. That, I'm, I'm just justifying why it's below these two. It's right, a better constructed song than Another Way to Die, if not a bit lazy, and it is better sang than Tomorrow Never Dies, but it is just so <sighs> dull and uninspired that I just, I never listen to it, I never think about it. Um, and, honestly, and that's I, I, yeah. I, 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 I've mentioned this before, I really like the disco version of it in the end credits. That's the only bearable <laughs> version of this song. Um, it's just not very good. And no. then, speaking of, there's a little bit of a, I've got like themes going on on my list here. The next one is... Also very uninspired and lazy, and uh, John Barry didn't give a shit. It's Tomorrow Never. I'm sorry, Man with the Golden Gun. For, for um, which one? Number two. Number two. Man with the wow. Golden Gun is. Oh my gosh! I can't uh, believe that. Man with the Golden Gun is so lazy, and and this one I let more. There's less. Is it lazy or is it just weird? It's <laughs> it's lazy. Um, because John Barry was you know because they made this movie back to back with um Live and Let Die. Yeah, you could like there's like. Evidence that um, John Barry didn't care about Moonraker so much because he was in a rush. But this one was made straight after Live and Let Die. And even though he didn't do Live and Let Die, he was doing other projects. And he just sort of rushed this one. This whole score is pretty rushed. Um, but especially the title song, he just sort of wrote a bunch of phallic-sounding, um, I guess, <laughs> things. And then just, like, it's very said, oh, random, it's a Bond song. Yeah, yeah and, and then uh, Lulu's just a very unappealing singer, kind of like Cheryl Crow in that, like, I don't think she has oh, the range. How dare you? I don't you? think she has how the range to sing you? this song. Um, what the? Oh, my God. It's just, I, I don't know. It's just a very unpleasant experience. And so, yeah, that's my that's my one through four, uh, sorry, four through, five through four. Two or whatever it is now. First anyway. of all, how <laughs> dare you say that Cheryl Crow is as bad as Lulu is in the Man of oh the Golden Gun? That is wow. I'll defend wow. that. Wow. I'll oh. defend that to my grave. I am very offended. Okay. All right. Let's <laughs> let's get through this. Um. Okay. Yes. Number five for me uh, is another way to die. Uh, very much for the same reasons that you meant. Really AFM. awful. It, it it is not a good song, but it is actually one that I kind of like uh, instrumentally, not vocally, uh-huh. but in, instrumental wise. I I do kind of d- uh, jive with it. Um, I like the drums a lot. Actually, this is a song that a friend and I uh, learned on drum set just because we just kind oh, of wow. found the the drum part to be pretty groovy. Um, That's cool. And I like I like Jack White's influence in the song. I actually feel like if it was just Jack White, I would have liked it a lot more. Um, Interesting. But they did Jack White and Alicia Keys and it's just really weird their harmonies are <laughs> awful the it's it's really bad like the way it was produced in in terms of the way it was produced um and it's really hard to defend the song but there is something about it that I can occasionally turn it on and jam to it i <laughs> ignoring the fact that it is a, a bond song um but it is in in no way a good song it is actually a very bad song fair <laughs> enough fair enough yeah um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, you, you already said most of the, the reasons why I, I dis- it's not a good song, but um, but I like the instrumentals, the guitar, the drum part. It's kind of groovy in some pieces. Um, and yeah, you know, it's just. Anyways, I've said all I need to say about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> number four uh, is one that you also had on your list, but in the latter half, and that is all time high. Uh-huh. Um, much for the same reasons that you said about Moonraker. I feel with. Um, all time high. Even though I do agree with your statements on Moonraker, the, all time high I just found to be a little bit more um, forgettable. I guess I can't really. I I don't just like innately start singing this one or or am drawn to this one. <laughs> you know, surprise. it's just like it'll come on. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a Bond song. <laughs> huh, that's a little weird. It's just you know, much in the same way that Octopussy is a very kind of movie. All Time High is a very kind hey, of song. Hey, 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 Octopussy, come on, let's let's lay off Octopussy a little bit. Huh? We've already yeah. discussed this. I, <laughs> Octopussy is not a good movie. Oh my it's, god, it is not. Um, and I think the and, and I think in that regard, the, the song fits the movie. So I, <laughs> you know, you take it as you will. You it's a just bitch. a very just. N- very uninspired, very forgettable, um, very subpar song. So that is why that's at uh, number four. Uh, number uh-huh. three is one that you already mentioned, and it is "Die Another Day." It's ah. 
Wow, way lower in a lot the of list. in a lot yeah. of ways. In a lot of ways, it is trash. It is truly <laughs> trash, and the, the auto tune yeah. is garbage. Um, I don't know what Madonna yeah. was. Oh, we are going to get to that in a second. I don't know what Madonna was thinking. Um, it's very awkwardly combined with a great montage at the beginning. I actually really like the the opening torture montage of Bond in yeah. North Korea. The song is just. My pet, very my, weird. My pet theory is that Bond is being tortured by make by making him listen to the song. Like you know, I think you're right. I really think you're right. Torture is like they wanted to torture the audience along with Bond to sort of simulate it. Very smart. Yeah. Clever filmmaking from Lee Tamahori. <laughs> it's just. It's just, oh my god. Oh. It's just when it, you know it, it's weird because the song starts with the clapping and I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. This is different. This is like hardcore. And then Madonna is like. Auto tune voice comes uh, in, and I'm just yeah. like, "Ooh, this just got bad really fast." <laughs> um, like, I, and, and we've had this conversation before. The only redeeming part of this song and why it's not higher is the string section. I really yeah. like the, the the string and orchestration of that. Um, the chorus is pretty catchy. I have to admit, if you take Madonna's voice out of it, mm-hmm. um, the breakdown where she's like, "Sigmund Freud analyze oh this," my God. and, and yeah, I'm just yeah. like. What is going on? It loses the plot at that point. Yeah. What? Why? Like, what (laughs) were you smoking when you did that? Who greenlit that song? I want to know. I really do want to know because it is, it is trash. The song. I I can't defend it. It's sure you could throw it on and it's like, oh, this is the early two thousands in a pop song and. Yeah. yeah, that's that's about right. Um, much for the same reasons that I didn't like "A View to a Kill." I, uh, you know, it, it being a pop song and not a Bond song. Um, only "Die Another Day" or only "A View to a Kill" is like Goldfinger compared to "Die Another Day." Let's be real here. Um, <laughs> but anyway, kind of just in the same sort of sentiment there. But um, yeah, yeah. "Die Another Day." Awful. You already knew it was going to make this list, but it's at number three for me. Yeah. And number two, I this is oh, weird. No. This is the second time on one of these discussions where I think our one and two were flip flopped. Yeah. My number two is for your eyes only. Oh. It's yeah. It's not good. It's it is not good. so yeah. It is it so boring. Awful. It is. Yeah, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm gonna jump. I'm just gonna jump in with number one just like. For, for time's sake, um, yeah, you do that. But um, yeah, just, no. For your eyes only is garbage. Like, like I think what you were saying, like it, it just it sounds bad. Sheena Easton is not a good pick for this. No, um, she sounds like she's like gargling water. And it's it it's like someone is like trying to do karaoke at like a bar. Yeah, it's not. It, it, honestly, that's exactly what it sounds like. And I, I'm I'm always yeah. shocked by how popular this song is. I always hear it in public. I, don't I always get hear it. people like who are into it, and it's like I don't. I don't yeah, I just don't understand. This song is not. Good. Right, but yeah, right. I know it's, it's and it's boring too. It's boring and forgettable, but also not good. So yeah, right. And, and the only reason I put it, um, I guess you could say below or, or higher, higher on a worse list than Die Another Day is because at least Die mm-hmm. Another Day was different. I'm not yeah. saying that the risk they took with the song Die Another Day paid off because I don't think it, <laughs> it did. But just for your eyes only would just lull you to sleep, and it's just painful it's like it's really listening to an awful karaoke rendition of a very mediocre if not bad song you know what i'm yep, saying for sure for sure couldn't agree more it's just garbage and the only reason why that's a number two is because my number one is the man with the golden gun i hate <laughs> the song it's awful it's so weird i don't know what the fuck they were thinking with that song it just there's no flow to that it's just like bum, 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 bum. it's just like john bear just wrote a bunch of notes on the page and he just threw them all over the place it's like oh who's yeah. a good singer um okay Le- lulu you hey you come here you sing this lyrics all right cool yeah just mishmash some weird awkward song together and it's it's so bad, man. Yeah. It's, I, I don't even know where they were going with it. It's like Same, there's no yeah. distinguishable melody and it's just It's a shame because this show, this song got picked over the uh the Alice Cooper song, which is actually pretty good. Yeah, like, it's not right. It's not bad. I mean it's not one of my favorite like rejected songs, but it's a hell of a lot better than oh, yeah. The Man with the Golden God. <laughs> like it's just th- there's a lot <sighs> much like what I said when we were talking about it with uh, when we were ranking our Roger Moore films, there's a lot of things in the Golden in Man with the Golden Gun that are just very awkward and weird. Yeah. And this is one of them. This is actually one of the biggest awkward and weirdest things that have to do with the Man with the Golden Gun. It's just, yeah. it's not good. <laughs> you know, it, at least in for good. your eyes only, I can hum the tune and like 
that I that's honestly the, where it, where it comes to differentiating oh the two. And at least there's like a structure to the song. The man with the golden gun is just like he's just like going all over the place it's like he's squirting like paint tubes in the air and trying to just make art on a canvas it's just so bad and as a fun fact for everyone listening this is the one that I always sing it is I I actually I hate it when you do that because it is so (laughs) bad oh Oh, dear but anyways that is our top 10 worst yes. Bond songs from our respective list. I know Excellent. there's definitely some overlap with you guys, but I also know that there are some on our list that, uh, specifically my list, that some of you mm-hmm. revere, and I apologize for that. But um, oh, what a shame. Anyways, and with that, that's going to do it with our show for this week. Thanks for tuning Excellent. in, listening, watching on YouTube, all that stuff. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Let us know your top 10 worst Bond songs in the comments section below. Um, and if you're listening to this on iTunes, please take the time to subscribe to this if you do enjoy the content we're putting out, and leave us a review and rating in the review and rating section of the podcast. It really, really does help us, help us out, helps us get noticed and all that sort of stuff. So if you're a fan of what we're doing, Doing, please support us in that way. Um, we also have uh, our, our show on uh, iHeartRadio. So if you're listening to this on YouTube and yes. you have an Android, you don't do um, iTunes and that sort of stuff, you can head on over to iHeartRadio. It's free. You can uh, subscribe to our podcast over there, much in the same way that it works on iTunes. It works on iHeartRadio. Yeah, all, all the downloads and the uh, the ratings and all that stuff helps us out over there. So if you are an Android user, download iHeartRadio. Uh, and subscribe to our podcast on there if you are a fan. For sure. And then, you know, if you're listening to this on YouTube, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the Men vs. Movies channel for, you know, our thoughts and opinions on stuff that don't pertain to James Bond. We have movie reviews and such. So be sure to check all that good stuff out. All all of our social media links and such are in the the, the description. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Looking at Men v. Movies, like I said, all this stuff is in the description uh, in of this episode, wherever you're watching it. Uh, Brody, yes. thank you for joining me on this fine Thursday. Where can people oh, find you on the interwebs? Uh, well, you can find me at Brody Cerevelli on Twitter. Uh, that's, that's Brody Cerevelli. Uh, it'll be in the description anyway. And It uh, is in the description, yes. Yes, so, so like, yeah. give me a follow because I'd love that. But uh, that's, that's pretty much the only place you can find me. So don't look me up on Facebook. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> there yeah, you go. That's, that's 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 me um but yeah always a pleasure absolutely and before i give you my twitter handle we are going to be recording our discussion on um live and let die a very kind of halloween-esque bond film we felt this is the most appropriate time to discuss it since it deals with voodoo and such we're probably going to record that sunday night and then we'll upload it whenever it's uh over so um be sure to be on a lookout for that it's gonna be a little special episode and it, it should be a good time we're gonna dive into that um yeah but anyways lastly guys if you like me specifically and you like what i have to say you can always give me a follow on twitter at griff schiller and that is gonna do it for episode number eight of the words are not enough thank you for joining us and until next week take care mm-hmm.